All right, and we're ready to rock. Uh, welcome, Dr. Rakeem Turnipseed from FMC Corporation, and welcome all of you. Thanks for joining us on this cold, snowy day here in Philadelphia. This is going to be another excellent Franklin Outside episode. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Valletta, environmental scientist with TFI, and today we're talking about one of my favorite topics. You've heard me talk about it before. You're going to hear me talk about it again. It is the dreaded spotted lantern lanternfly. And you might be wondering why the heck we're talking about it this time of year. Now, we want to end 2020 on a high note. There's been an overwhelming array of negative news, but it turns out there's some really good news when it comes to this invasive pest. And there's a lot of really neat science happening. And uh, Dr. Turnipseed is going to help us understand a little bit about that. Uh, so before we go into talking about the spotted lanternfly and sort of dusting off the cobwebs and reminding all of you what it's all about and the impact it's having uh, here in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia, I'll uh, let Dr. Turnipseed introduce himself. Uh, let us know, Dr. Turnipseed, what it is that you do at, at FMC and, and why the heck we're thinking about spotted lanternflies together. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So again, my name is Dr. Rakim Turnipseed, and I um, am a global product development manager for insecticides at FMC Corporation. And basically what that means is I am a scientist that uh, helps uh, develop insecticide products that we use to combat uh, a variety of different types of organisms and pests, you know, invasive species, uh, pests that are related to uh, public health, um, and, and the whole nine yards. And so um, I've been here for about two and a half years now, and I'm happy to be here today with you. Excellent. Well, thank you again uh, graciously for offering your time to join us today. And we should say that FMC, of course, is a very generous sponsor at TFI. So we love tapping the hive mind that they all have over there, um, including right. today on, <laughs> on the spotted lanternfly. So let's get to it. I've got a, just a couple photos to share around. Again, just to jog everyone's memory. If you're com coming in from Philadelphia today, uh, nothing that I'm sharing today will be a surprise to you. We know that the spotted lanternfly has been a major pest for us. If you went out this past summer, you probably saw areas of Center City, West Philadelphia, just absolutely littered um, with the carcasses of spotted lanternflies. Um, they are these sort of beguiling uh, beauties, beguiling beauties, excuse me. They've got this double wing feature, that beautiful pink coloration. Um, but we know, of course, that they're wreaking havoc across the state of Pennsylvania and along the East Coast. Uh, the spotted lanternfly life cycle looks something like this. You've probably seen the adults. Again, they've got that double wing structure, beautiful pink coloration with a yellow body underneath. And in the fall time and into the winter time, of course, that's where we find ourselves now. That's why it's timely to be talking about this portion of the life cycle. We are on the lookout for spotted lantern flight eggs. And we'll talk about why those are problematic. Um, but in the springtime, those eggs are going to hatch, of course, into the nymph phases, into these tiny itty bitty black bodied with white spots nymphs. They're about half the size of a chocolate chip. Um, they grow into these bright red nymphs in the early summertime, and in the later summertime, eventually, they uh, enter into their adult phase. Um, bringing us back all the way around um, to this top left portion here, where the adult females will lay those eggs um, and put a sort of a sticky casing over those eggs. Each of those uh, casings can contain upwards of 30 or 50 eggs individual eggs. Uh, so we want to make sure this time of year we're looking out uh, to crush those guys. And we have a video from last spring that you can check out on how to do that. Um, but there have been some other creative ways to go about um, attacking and killing the spotted lanternfly. Uh, some of the best homemade um, features that I've come across, um, probably not that effective. Here's a homemade propane torch uh, on the top left here. Um, on the bottom right, this fella is using a uh, pressure washer uh, to, I suppose, dispel the spotted lantern flies from the tree trunks. Obviously not that effective at killing them. Um, but there is some other really cool science that's happening in this space. Um, some basic residential solutions. You've seen these around. These are just tree bands. Um, we know that those little baby nymphs like to crawl up the edges of the tree trunks and they get stuck on this sticky paper. This is an excellent small scale solution. Um, again, for, for residents, individuals that have trees in their yards, um, very, very effective, but can also kill off some ma mammalian species. Uh, you've probably seen small squirrels and birds can get stuck in these. So there are some downsides uh, to the tree bands as well. Other interesting solutions I've come across is using 
um, sent dogs to actually track down spotted lanternflies. Uh, just this past summer, a program out of the University of Pennsylvania, um, working with a couple state agencies, uh, training this German Shepherd Lucky um, to uh, hunt down spotted lanternflies to actually sniff out uh, their honeydew, their sweet, uh, sticky residue that they secrete. Um, and potentially really, really useful along the edges of the areas that we already know infestations to occur. So we could be seeing um, dogs helping, helping in this fight. And another um, interesting study that has come out of researchers from Cornell University and Penn State University is using a type of insecticide called a myco insecticide. And uh, Dr. Turnipseed can help us understand much more about um, what insecticides are actually capable of doing and how we, how we produce them. Um, but these insecticides, the active ingredient is actually a fungus. And you can see it uh, growing here on an adult spotted lanternfly first documented in a really neat publication last summer in 2019 uh, in the journal PNAS. Uh, there were actually two naturally occurring fungi that seemed to be um, very aggressively attracted to the spotted lanternfly for some reason. And maybe we can ask you, Dr. Turnipsey, why it is that, that a certain fungal species might like a, a certain invasive species. Um, and recent applications just this past summer documented in a new journal article found that insecticides that contained these fungal species were um, had about after, excuse me, after a, an application of these insecticides saw about a 40 to 50 percent mortality rate. That's a pretty good percentage um, of essentially a kill rate uh, to get at those spotted lanternflies. But we know that we want to make sure we have all of the tools accessible to us. Uh, some of these, as mentioned, are better on small scale, uh, some potentially better on, on larger scales. And that's exactly where folks like Dr. Turnipsey come in and help us um, start to address some of these bigger, maybe commercial scale agricultural issues. Um, and so one of those uh, issues that we should mention before we jump in here, Dr. Turnipseed, to talking about the products that you're working on. Um, we know that this is a widespread issue. A recent report out of Penn State uh, estimated that following a really, really bad outbreak of the spotted lanternfly, we could be seeing hundreds of millions of economic damages. Um, what is it that the spotted lanternfly actually likes to attack um, here in Pennsylvania um, and elsewhere? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for having me, Rachel. So, you know, the primary host uh, for the spotted lanternfly, both for the nipple stage and the adult stage, uh, would be uh, this plant or tree called the uh, tree of heaven. Um, and it's also called Ilanthus altissima by its scientific name. Um, so, you know, homeowners and buildings that have that type of plant and its surroundings um, tend to see large numbers of this particular invasive species. Okay. And what's so special about the Tree of Heaven? Why is there a particular penchant of the spotted lanternfly for the Tree of Heaven? Well, this just tends to be a tree that the pest has become heavily associated with um, um, through time. And the Tree of Heaven itself is also an invasive species. It was introduced many years ago, uh, many, many years ago. Um, but, you know, it's considered uh, to be a weed depending on who you talk to. But, you know, over time, you, you can get these plant-insect interactions that just uh, evolve to, to be uh, very strong in their interactive uh, approaches um, over time. You mentioned something earlier, though, about the fungus that's used to sure. uh, control. Um, oftentimes, when you're dealing with, um, you know, invasive species, you have difficulties managing it because it has no natural predators or natural enemies to keep it in check in the population. Um, and those natural enemies tend to be present in the natural homeland of that particular pest. So the spotted lanternfly is actually not native to the United States, it's native um, to uh, parts of Asia. And in parts of Asia, you have these natural um, enemies that are present. So you might have, you know, praying mantids, for example, that keep it in check. Um, but there also can be other, you know, entomopathogenic fungi um, that would also keep it in check. And so the fungus that you referred to earlier actually can be very uh, host specific to different types of uh, pests. And that would explain why you might see uh, some efficacy there um, when you're using those types of natural remedies. Okay, excellent. So some, so some big terms there, so let's break down. Um, and I apologize for the, the pronunciation here, entomopathogenic. Can oh, you break down yeah, that word so, for us? You use so that? Entomopathogenic. So that essentially just means that th there's an organism 
that is being used with its natural means to control an insect. So entomo uh, means insect and pathogenic uh, means something that uh, can kill. I mean, it sort of acts as a pathogen. So when we think about an entomopathogenic fungus, it's basically a fungus uh, that naturally occurs um, that when it's in contact with an insect, it will kill the insect. And so you might use a more natural means like that as um, an alternative to using a, uh, uh, a less natural means, more of a synthetic uh, means. More of a synthetic, right. And so something, you know, you and I have, I've, I've asked you in previous conversations is why might there be advantages to sort of exploring both these um, natural based, fungus based insecticides, I'll call them natural based, but correct me if there's a, if there's a better term, versus using a synthetic. Um, you know, we know we, we want to at all costs address this pest. We, we don't want those economic damages. We don't want um, those individual businesses, um, you know, sort of put out. So, so what, are, what are the advantages to exploring all of these different um, solutions? Yeah, so I, I would say um, when you're looking at, you know, natural or organic or anything in that space, you know, oftentimes um, you are using it for contact kill purposes, meaning you are spraying the particular organism directly with that product. Um, and, you know, you, they tend to break down more easily in the environment, right? And so, you know, farmers oftentimes will look for that type of product. Um, whereas with the synthetic pesticide, you know, oftentimes you're dealing with a product that will be more longer lasting um, in the environment. So you're getting increased, what we call residual. Um, and that can be good, right, if you're using other approaches with it, because when you have a product that, you know, works longer and has a higher residual, um, the applicator is actually not having to apply uh, as frequently um, in the environment. Um, and the amount of volume of uh, product that's being applied can also be uh, reduced if you're using a product associated with, you know, longer, you know, persistence after application. Okay, so let's explore that a little bit more. So you mentioned, you know, we often, I think sort of in the, in the general culture, for those of us that are, you know, unfamiliar with insecticides and pesticides, myself certainly uh, included here, we often, I think, have a, have a tendency to prefer terms like natural and organic, right? Um, but as you mentioned there, they, they might, what's great about them, it may actually be a weakness when it comes to their efficacy or their usefulness in attacking the spotted lanternfly. You mentioned there, for example, that they perhaps they break down too quickly, um, or perhaps we'd have to add more product more frequently, which translates to, in the very real world, more money, more workers, uh, right. more labor. Do I, do I sort of have that right at a high level? That is correct, Rachel. Yep. Right. And so the advantages of the synthetics then um, have, as you mentioned, residual. So perhaps they stick around a little bit longer. And do we notice in general that um, synthetics then for that reason are, are generally um, more efficacious at, at attacking invasive species? Yeah. So the, you know, the thing about synthetics is that, you know, you deal with various different classes of synthetic insecticides. So not all synthetic insecticides are the same, right? So you, you could have some that belong to what we call the pyrethroy class. And that works, um, you know, technically by impacting what we call sodium channel gates within the ner nervous system of the insect. Um, and I mentioned that mode of action, that technical term, because, you know, you could have another class of insecticide um, that acts on, you know, an enzyme that control something else in the insect system. But, you know, they all work by killing the insect ultimately or the invasive species ultimately, um, but they do so by various different means. And, you know, the reason why we care about using different classes of insecticides when possible is because uh, you can deal with something called insecticide resistance. Um, so this is where uh, you have insects that are in the population or invasive, invasive species that are in the population and certain populations are um, more biologically equipped to uh, withstand an insecticide application because they are resistant to that particular uh, active ingredient in that formulation. So if you're using uh, various different approaches, you're not having to just rely on one particular chemistry, right? You know, you can rely on uh, various different methods. Got it. Got it. Okay. And that's exactly one of the things that um, you folks are exploring at FMC. So um, there's a lot of, you know, 
heavy detail that we can't really go into here and, and that's okay but sort of take us through the process um at fmc you know where are you guys at with with developing um your own um product to to get at the spotter lantern fly and and what does that process look like again sort of at that at that high level yeah so i would say um generally when whenever we think about developing a product you know there are stages that we go through right and so the first would be called the ideation stage and that's where you know someone like myself or maybe you know a uh a formulator, uh, we would work together and just come up with an idea, you know, to say, oh, well, you know, what if we develop a product that is of this type of formulation? Um, because, you know, not all formulations are the same. Some can be dust, some can be uh, liquid formulations or, or what have you. Um, so you just get a general idea. Um, but then you would go into what's called proof of concept, right? And that's where we are, you know, trying to ascertain or determine the feasibility of the product, you know? So how well do we think it's actually going to work? How stable do we think the formula is going to be through time? Um, you know, and then you would go through uh, defining the product and um, developing the product. And, you know, along the way, we are checking off boxes from a regulatory standpoint, right? We have to make sure that the proper human um, risk assessments are done, um, environmental toxicity studies. Um, we need to make sure that when the product is actually applied in the environment, um, that it is not um, causing harm to non-target organisms. We have to make sure that uh, plants um, are not exhibiting what we call phytotoxicity. So um, certain chemicals, when they are applied to plants, they can actually burn the plant. Um, and so we don't necessarily want that. So there are a plethora of different studies that we have to uh, to execute before we can actually commercialize a product before people, uh, you know, like you, the general public would actually come about, you know, getting the product in their hands. Okay, so that's sort of the peek behind the curtain there, you know, right, the whole, right. so the whole run of it. That, so, so, and, and as far as um, what FMC actually is doing, of course, I, you know, I can't go specifically into what we're doing, but, you know, I can say that there are certain products that we do have, um, on the market uh, that are not necessarily registered with the EPA right now for spotted lanternfly, but we have what's called uh, a two double E uh, recommendation. And basically what that says is um, for a particular product that we know has some efficacy or that works against a particular uh, pest, um, even, if it, even if the current label that is registered with the EPA does not uh, prescribe us to um, target that pest, uh, there can be some provisions or exceptions made um, under the right conditions. And we, we do have that with some of our products at FMC uh, for use against spotted lanternfly, um, which include uh, our, our Scion insecticide, um, which uses uh, gamma cyhalothrin um, as its active ingredient. And so that's just one, you know, uh, that belongs to the pyrethroid class that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also have our Tau Star insecticide, which uses bifenthrin as the active ingredient. Um, and then we have our uh, baseline uh, insecticide as well. So all of these, um, you know, we have a special uh, recommendation that allows us to, to target this particular uh, pest in certain Got states. It. So almost like a, you know, I'm thinking about the COVID vaccine and FDA is sort of giving these, you know, rapid approvals for, for certain rushed scenarios. It's, it's kind, exactly. of, kind of akin to that, isn't it? Yeah, you can right. think of it like that. So to, to, to recap sort of what you just said there and zoom out even further, just hitting on the idea again that there are a, a very many different ways we can go about affecting different pests, some perhaps a little bit more general and, and working on others that are now very targeted at the spotted lanternfly. Um, so we have a couple couple great questions that have come through and folks can continue um, um, submitting those. And one viewer asks, I thought that organic was better for humans in the environment. So if synthetic is better for killing insects, how do we balance that? So I'll ask that question and I'll add on my own um, to, to ask if you could explain to us a little bit further about those environmental toxicity uh, reports and all of those, you know, in-depth processes that you folks explore, because I think it probably has to do with the answer to this guy. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So like I said, there are a suite of different um, studies that we would have to run to, uh, you know, satisfy uh, EPA's requirements when registering a product. Um, so you would do uh, some terrestrial studies, some non-target studies on a variety of different uh, organisms. Um, when we think about bees, for example, right, um, a class of insecticides that has been associated with um, 
you know, be harm um, would be uh, neonicotinoids, right? And so um, there's a lot of scrutiny over that particular class of insecticides. But when a product contains those types of active ingredients from that class um, and used according to the label, then, you know, we are considered to be abiding by, you know, federal law. But just going higher level, right? Um, whenever you're using an insecticide, um, you know, whether it's from FMC or, or somewhere else, you know, you're not necessarily supposed to rely just on that insecticide, right? You know, you would use that in combination with other methods, right? So you mentioned, you know, those egg masses with the spotted lanternfly. Um, you're not necessarily going to use an insecticide to, to kill those only. You would, um, you know, employ scraping methods, right? You know, you would scrape those egg masses off, put them into alcohol to kill them. Um, and, you know, also we would recommend, you know, not moving around firewood. Um, because spotted lanternfly, uh, they tend to be associated with firewood. Um, they are very invasive also because they can let, the adults can lay eggs on a variety of different surfaces. So just being um, aware of the different uh, areas in your yard um, where you might, you know, be facilitating their development. Um, and then if you can make sure that those things are removed from your, your property, you know, that can also help. So there's an integrated approach that you should be using overall. So is there sort of a, a basic sequence of events here? Is it the case that we don't want to use insecticides until we've exhausted all of these other options? Yeah, so when, when you think about the life cycle that you mentioned earlier, and this is why it's important to understand the life cycle, even when you're uh, thinking about product development and timing of applications, because um, the adults, you know, they are laying eggs, you know, throughout the fall, you know, when they are active, um, right? And those eggs over winter, um, so even right now, during this cold spell we're going through, you know, eggs are out in the environment and they are overwintering and they are going to hatch out in the following spring as the um, season warms. And so what we would tend to recommend for spotted lanternflies to make sure, again, that you are scraping those eggs, you know, right now all through, um, you know, early spring prior to hatch, right? Um, there are also some types of traps that you can put into, uh, onto trees, you know, sticky traps, um, you could put, uh, and that could consist of, you know, petroleum jelly that's placed on top of tape or some other type of trap. Um, someone mentioned uh, before, well, how do you prevent other non-target organisms from getting stuck on those traps, right? So, you know, other larger organisms aren't going to tend to uh, be impacted by sticky traps that have, you know, certain types of coatings on them. Um, there's also screens that can be put over those traps on the trees that would uh, prevent larger organisms from being able to come into contact with the trap. So, so there, you know, you could do the egg scraping, you could, you know, use traps, and then, you know, you would think about using um, insecticides as well. Um, and we have what are called contact insecticides. So those are insecticides that you either apply directly to the organism, or you can apply it to a surface and when the organism passes over that surface, you know, it'll be impacted that way. Um, or you can, um, you know, Penn State researchers uh, even have investigated uh, active ingredients that have systemic properties. And what systemic means is that, you know, when the um, product is applied, you know, to, to soil or, or to the base of a, a plant, it can actually be, you know, uptaken through the plant so that when the spotted lanternfly feeds through the bark, um, on the phloem tissue of the plant, um, it is actually in, intaking or uptaking the um, toxin um, in their system and, you know, they can die that way. So there are a variety of different methods that you can sure. um, achieve the goal. Sure. So sort of hijacking natural processes anyway to, to our benefit. Exactly. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So we, we covered a whole heck of a lot there. Um, and th this is this is really fascinating because I think that we often just sort of ban insecticides into this this category of, of bad, but actually the science behind it obviously is is really, really targeted and, and really rigorous. Um, Absolutely. And you mentioned different applications here, specifically contact uh, applications, and that, have to, that has to do with a, another question we received. And uh, this viewer asks, do I have to wait until I see them in the spring uh, to spray insecticide, or can I do anything to prevent them from coming? I live in the woods and now I'm nervous. Um, so is it in terms of application, maybe we should say first, would you recommend individuals to go out and spray insecticides and 
If so, maybe which should they choose? Um, or are there other techniques you might recommend first? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say, again, the initial technique that I would recommend are uh, scraping is to scrape those um, egg masses, right? Because, you know, the more egg masses that you are getting rid of, um, you know, that's 20, 30, 50 per, you know, per mass that, that you are preventing from developing into adults, ultimately. Um, and, and you should be doing that now. You can be looking for those egg masses now all through the, uh, the, the early spring prior to hatch. Um, and like I said, I mentioned, you know, preventing movement of firewood, um, you know, they tend to be associated with um, vehicles that are not moving, so parked vehicles, so you might see them often on tires, uh, for example. Um, so just, again, making sure that those different things in your property that would uh, be conducive for their survival and um, development that you are removing those from your property as well. So vigilance. And, State, and I was going to say, you know, Penn State researchers and other universities, you know, they work with companies like, you know, FMC, you know, chemical manufacturers, you know, it's not just one company, you know, doing it all, you know, we work with the university officials um, to, you know, investigate research that, you know, uh, needs to be done so that we can better answer additional questions. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point here. Um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about product development, but ultimately the goal here is to deal with the pest. Um, right. And so lots of resource and, and knowledge sharing um, obviously happening. So um, in terms then of that original question, um, what, what should we do now? It seems like uh, Dr. Turnipseed's recommendation is, is vigilance. Um, at this point, particularly this time of year, we're looking um, for those egg casings. Um, again, TFI, we, we did a video um, back in April, I believe it was, um, I was out crawling around in the woods showing you all how to uh, scrape those eggs off. You can, you can check that out um, on our Facebook Live videos. Uh, we've got uh, another question here, and I think it, it uh, sounds um, like a previous question we've had, um, so forgive me for the redundancy. Uh, this viewer asks, can I spray the tree even before the egg masses ah, to prevent them from attaching? Has, are you familiar, Dr. Turnipseed, with any research uh, into pre- pre-spraying or preparing the tree in some fashion uh, such that the egg masses can't be uh, laid down in the first place? Yeah, so, so there, I guess there's a couple of ways that I can approach that. So um, researchers, university researchers specifically have conducted research on, um, like I said, those systemic insecticides that, um, you know, depending on the specific active ingredient that you're talking about, um, it would need to be applied earlier in the season um, so that by the time the damaging stages, you know, hatch out and are present, uh, the insecticide will already be present in the tree so that when they go to feed, they'll be, they'll be dead. Um, but what you have to keep in mind, though, too, is that, you know, you, you can't apply so early to where you risk um, damaging or harming bees, right, you know, during periods of bloom uh, with flowers. Uh, so that's something that we're always keeping in mind when we're thinking about timing. Um, as far as actually coating a, a complete tree um, with some type of product that would prevent the eggs uh, from being attached, um, I don't think that there is a whole lot of research that has been done on that. You know, that, that's a gap, I, I would say, and we could definitely explore that further. Um, but I, I would say the closest to that where we know that there is some, you know, effective approaches is, again, like I said, applying those sticky traps to the tree. Um, and, you know, they can be these very narrow bands or, you know, they can be, you know, wide, just depending on, you know, the particular plant species that you're dealing with. Great. And I guess I'll, I'll uh, you know, turn everybody's attention to the Penn State Extension Office. Um, FMC has been a great resource for a lot of this information. The Penn State Extension Office uh, works with the U.S. Department of Agriculture and has a bevy of information um, on those solutions that are already available uh, to you, whether or not they are sort of as what we've called mechanical, I've learned from Dr. Turnipseed here, so some of those um, physical barriers, perhaps the, um, the sticky tape, um, or other techniques uh, like egg crushing um, or even insecticide applications. Check out the um, Penn State's Extension Office. And just to sort of round off those, those class of questions pertaining to, to trees that we should um, potentially be coding or, or not, um, you know, 
can you remind us, Dr. Turnipseed, which of those uh, species is particularly targeted by the spotted lanternfly and where we should be um, paying extra vigilance to if we're hunting them down? Yeah, I would say you should pay close attention to, uh, again, the tree of heaven um, called Ailanthus altissima. Um, that's one of its primary hosts. Um, the nymphal stages tend to um, be quite harmful to a variety of roses, um, you know, uh, earlier in the season. Um, birch, uh, maple, some oaks, uh, sycamore um, have also been shown to be uh, potential hosts of the, uh, the spotted lanternfly. Now, I've also heard that in earlier iterations of um, research into the spotted lanternfly that they have a, a penchant for, we know that they like grapes, for example, um, yeah. peach trees, apple trees. Is it because these trees um, tend to have higher sugar content? We know that they, they feed on, on that sugary sap. Um, has there been sort of any consensus around why they might have a, have a penchant for those sugary trees? Yeah, so, so that does have a lot to do with it, right? And, and you, when you think about um, the nymphal and the adult stages, um, they are not efficient metabolizers. Um, and so what that means ultimately is that they have to take in quite a lot of sap from a plant in order to get the nutrients that they need um, to, to continue their survival. But, you know, again, as they are taking in all of that sap um, and converting it into nutrients, um, there are extra, you know, there's extra, uh, I guess, substance that is still there that ends up getting excreted from their bodies. And that's what we call honeydew. And so interestingly enough, when the populations are so high, um, people have often described that when they are under a tree, uh, it looks like raindrops, you know, coming down because of all of the honeydew. Oh, yuck. <laughs> and, and, and it can actually occlude their vision um, if the populations are high enough. Um, so again, targeting those specific trees that we recommend, um, like uh, Tree of Heaven and, you know, some others that, that are mentioned um, would be a, a good idea. Uh, in some cases, you know, you might even use some, some herbicides uh, to target certain uh, tree species and uh, other plant species as well that the spotted lanternfly tends to be associated with. Okay. Okay, excellent. So we have covered a, an extremely wide range um, of content here. Um, Dr. Turnipsey, let me, let me thank you for that. And, and maybe just pivot a little bit as we're talking, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, folks that, that develop insecticides as mad scientists. And I mean, were you the kid as, as a young child? that was sort of trying to fry ants on the sidewalk or <laughs> does one actually get into to you know this this line of work yeah well it is quite interesting um i've definitely always been someone interested in you know science uh, math as well as music um and my other life um but I, I would say, you know, when you get to college and you're t deciding what to study, um, you know, I decided to go down the, the path of entomology. And what I found was that there are a variety of different uh, fields within entomology. Um, and so ultimately, you know, you could study, you know, plant insect interactions all the way to um, insecticide toxicology, um, where you're um, studying, um, you know, how different chemicals work. Um, one insects, uh, nervous systems, and other uh, by other physiological means, um, and so for me, you know, I got my bachelor's and master's uh, degrees in entomology, and then went on to do my PhD. Um, and I didn't necessarily study the spotted lanternfly for my PhD. I actually studied um, the behavioral and physiological ecology of mosquitoes and their association with weed uh, species. So. Um, more of a public health um, approach there and stand there. But uh, ultimately, once you get into this, um, especially outside of academia, like when you work for an organization like FMC, you tend to be exposed uh, to a, a wide range of different um, fields within entomology. Um, but ultimately, we tend to have the same common goal, which is to you know, be able to develop products to combat you know, invasive species, public health, uh, species so that we can have a better, you know, world, you know, more healthy uh, living and a better environment. Awesome. Well, thanks for that rundown. So for any budding uh, entomologists out there, there are, there's lots of directions to explore. It sounds like um, Dr. Turnipseed, obviously, uh, to now, now thinking about the spotted lantern fly, but coming maybe from a mosquito background. So it's really, really compelling, I think, to hear about that public health aspect uh, in particular. Ultimately, again, what all of this work is in service of is handling pests because they threaten humans um, in some fashion. So 
I guess I'll, I'll thank you again, talk to Dr. Rakeem Turnipseed, excuse me, <laughs> um, Product Development Manager in the Insecticides Division with FMC Corporation. Thank you so very much for joining us today and, and for helping us clarify, pull back the curtain a bit on the insecticide development process, uh, helping us understand where we're at in terms of the battle against the spotted lanternfly. Um, and I do hope you and your family have a very warm and, and healthy holiday. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Rachel. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Yes, and, and thanks to our, our audience for joining us today. That does it for my 2020 series. Hopefully we're ending on a good note here. You know, one of the one of the bad features that um, we've been dealing with here in Philly, the spotted lanternfly, hopefully some solutions coming to light uh, now and in the very near future. So uh, I will extend that warm holiday wish to all of you at home. Again, healthy and happy holidays to you folks. And uh, we'll see you in 2021. Thanks everyone. Bye, have a good one.